Chapter 15 The Messiahship The early church faced a problem, not in the recognition of Christ's deity, but his humanity. There were too many eyewitnesses to the miracles and power of Jesus Christ. As long as witnesses were alive, both Rome and Judea preferred to be silent about facts which could not be answered. Late in the first century, it was the joy of the surviving witnesses to the life of Christ to greet each other joyfully, saying, Have you seen? We have seen. Have you heard? We have heard. Have you touched? We have touched. John, in his first letter, begins by referring to his privilege of having been one who saw, heard, and touched the Lord of glory. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 1 1-3 Believing that the risen Christ is the Christ or Messiah and the very Son of God was not the problem. It was believing that this person was also man. As a result, one group, the earliest group of heretics, if we accept the Judaizers, insisted on reducing Jesus' humanity to an illusion an appearance assumed for a time by God. These were the Doceti and their faith, Gnostic in origin, Docetism. The deity of Christ was easiest of all to believe for all in the early years. Also, Jesus was recognized by the Church as the Christ, the Messiah. Add to this the fact that most of the members of the early Church were Jews, and for them, Christ was not Jesus' last name, but his royal title. At its minimum, the Jews of our Lord's day believed that the Messiah would be a royal descendant of David, endowed by the Spirit of God to establish a new and greater kingdom. The foundation of his throne would be justice in terms of God's law. His realm would be worldwide, and it would be a kingdom over this world. The early church took this faith and hope and expanded it in terms of the combined teaching of both testaments. The prophecies of Isaiah were especially popular preaching texts, verses such as Isaiah 2, 1-4, which see all nations ruled from Zion, the true church, and world peace under the government of the Christ. Isaiah 9, 1-7 not only prophesied the birth of Jesus Christ, but declared him to be the king of the increase of of whose government there shall be no end. The law, the writings, and the prophets were joyfully read with their promises of the triumph of the Christ. Whatever their eschatologies, the early church, until Augustine and his amillennialism, saw only a very literal triumph by Christ over the nations of this world. For the early church, Jesus Christ was very literally King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19.16. For them, this world was very seriously a realm to be conquered for Christ and by Christ. This presented a problem in dealing with the state, Jewish, Roman, Parthian and all else. If Jesus Christ is King and Lord, God incarnate and believers are members of his royal household and kingdom, then what place is there for allegiance to any other state? Indeed, what right does any other state have even to exist? We cannot understand Paul's answer in Romans 13, 11 following, apart from this problem. A very serious impediment to the understanding of the letters of the New Testament is the failure of many to think of their context. None of the apostles dealt with abstractions, they wrote an answer to specific questions and problems. The questions Paul deals with in Romans 13 are obvious in the text. Can we be obedient to any ungodly rulers or authorities now that the Messiah has come? 
Do we not disobey Christ our Lord if we obey these ungodly rulers? What is our obligation to these rulers, if any? In Israel and Judea, the authorities had been, in name at least, ministers of God, whatever their waywardness. Roman and other rulers represent the world of will worship and idolatry. Was it no compromise to pay taxes or to obey civil laws and magistrates? These were not the questions of rebellious men, but the earnest inquiries of believers who wanted to be faithful to Jesus Christ and were ready to die for him whose death had given them salvation for time and eternity. Paul's answer takes on a clearer meaning when we recognize its context. First, Paul categorically demands submission to all higher powers. This is a religious principle required by God who has ordained all such powers for his sovereign purposes. While all obedience to human authorities is subject to God's prior authority and in terms of his word, submission is the general premise because we are not our own, we are the Lord's and he sets the terms of our life by his law word. Second, we are to obey for conscience sake, Romans 13, 5, that is because God requires it. We obey ungodly rulers not because the state requires it, but because God requires it. We are subject, therefore, not, quote, for wrath, end quote, or fear of punishment, but on religious ground, that is, in terms of God's explicit word. Third, these rulers are called ministers or deacons of God, called to serve him as a ministry of justice. They, quote, are ordained of God, end quote, Romans 13.1. They are thus no less under God than we are. To resist lawful authority is to resist the ordinance of God and to receive damnation. Romans 13.2 We are to, quote, render therefore to all their dues, end quote, Romans 13.7 And Paul spells this out specifically. Fourth, it is clear what the ministry of rulers is to be, that is, to be a terror to evil works. Romans 13.3 Thus, just as God through Paul lays down the duty of obedience for the subject, he also lays down the duty of obedience for the ruler to be a terror to evildoers. The state has a duty to maintain order, and the name of that order is justice. Obedience is thus required from both the state and the peoples thereof. Obedience to God. Those Gentiles who, while not having received the law from God given through Moses, do still, because God's law is a law of life, keep that law to some degree, do thereby manifest that law which God has written in the being of all men. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Thus, unbelief on the part of rulers is not a ground in itself for civil disobedience, as long as the state is a terror to evildoers and the protector of the just. When it is hostile to Christ's work and seeks to hamper or destroy it, quote, we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. Also, when the state becomes a terror to good works, it has ceased to merit our obedience. As a minister of God, the state must be, quote, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil, Romans 13.4. Fifth, from all this, it is clear that the state has been placed by God on a theological basis. As much as any man or the church, it has the duty to serve and obey God. No more than any man is the state exempt from God's law and judgment. While the Christian can be a subject to a state which is not Christian, he must recognize that God sees the state as his ministry, not an agency for the welfare of rulers or the people. If the state is the minister of God, then it must recognize the Lord Christ, the Messiah, and like all things else, serve and obey him. The early church resisted Rome's attempts to license and control the church in the name of Christ's lordship. The Messiah is Lord over all things, including the state, and it is blasphemy for the state to seek to control Christ's body, the church, his embassy on earth. 
It is one thing for us to submit with respect to our persons, property and work, another for the state to claim submission from the church. There is not one word in all the New Testament to give any ground for this. How can Jesus be the Messiah, the world ruler, if the state governs and controls his embassy? The Messiah is the judge over the nations, Isaiah 2.4. How can he in any sense be made subject to them? If he is king over all kings and lord over all lords, Revelation 19.16, how can the subjects command their lord Messiah? The simple fact is that it was not morally or theologically possible for the early church to justify submission, nor is it possible now. Our Lord both recognised the existence of the state and also its demonic lust for power apart from him. Luke twenty two twenty five to 30 Christ called his disciples and appointed unto them a kingdom, the messianic kingdom of God. Luke twenty two twenty nine and 30 This was not a realm to surrender to Caesar. Indeed, he called the realm of the ungodly state, quote, the power of darkness, end quote. Luke twenty two fifty three. Paul calls attention to the ungodliness of civil governments outside of Christ. 1 Corinthians two eight six one. This realm is to be converted and placed under Christ, not Christ under anything of man. For the Messiah to be under any human power was for the apostolic age unthinkable. Conflict between Christ's church and the Caesars was thus inescapable.